Hello again, I am Pius Kujo Baka. Straight to our very first story. The World Bank has indicated that it might review future use of its financial guarantee for Ghana's borrowings. The bank was in April forced to make about $372 million coupon payments on Ghana's 2030 euro bond. Now, this was after the country defaulted on payments for the 2030 bond issued in 2015. Country director of the World Bank, Pierre Laporte, tells Joy Business this could be a measure to help check the country's rising debt stock. So now we've only been doing uh, project support, mm. which is in line with what our country partnership framework. But with the reform in place, we've uh, readjusted our pipeline, our list of projects coming to factor in this budget support. Budget support. It will be a three-year program for $300 million each, totaling $900 million over three years. Mm. And we expect because the fund program will overlap the year after, we will put uh, another 250. So we will put over the four years about 1.1 billion. I'll come back to that. Mm -hmm. Then because of the f effects of the fiscal consolidation, we've also brought in early on uh, additional financing for social protection mm -hmm. of 150 million, which is going to the board this month. So this will come early. Our budget support will come in the second half of the year. But we've also brought in uh, a financial sector support project, mm -hmm. as you know, with the domestic uh, restructuring of debt, domestic yeah, debt. Yeah. This have, have impacted the banks, yeah. the capital adequacy have been uh, hit. And uh, as we speak, most banks, if not all, have, uh, are probably below the capital adequacy requirement. Yeah. And uh, we are bringing, bringing in $250 million in emergency financial support project mm. to help uh, central bank and uh, government cushion the impact on the yeah. banks of uh, liquidity and we're focusing mostly on solvency mm. issues. But I want to make an important point. We will continue to deliver our regular projects. For instance, now in this month, we will bring a, an agriculture diversification project to the board, 400 million. We will also bring actual financing of 150 for Great Acre Resilience Project. Uh, so we will continue to do mm. our, our mm. regular work. Mm. Yeah. Let, let, let me try and focus on the, 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 the budget support mm. visit program thing, mm. and that about $900 million. Yeah. Is that also before the board, uh, when are we hoping that we could be getting the first strength? Will that be dependent on just like the IMF program meeting some conditions okay. or prior actions to yeah. ensure that those disbursements come in? Can you update us on that one, please? Absolutely. Our plan, mm. our hope, is we can bring this to the board by September. Mm. But it will all depend how fast we reach agreement with government on the, on the prior actions. Uh, it may be September, it may slip in October, but we're hoping we need to do it this year because IMF has factored in into its financing gap. You know, yeah. when IMF goes to the board, yeah. if there's a gap, they cannot go. So mm. they factored in 300 million from the World Bank. Mm. But this 300 million, I want to be very clear, it's not acquired, it's not given, it's not taken that World Bank will come and give. Mm. We need to have a strong reform package from government that accompanies as prior actions for us to deliver this 300 million. And these have to be in areas where us and government agree, these are areas that have caused problems for the budget or for the sectors. For instance, I cannot go in all the details because we are still talking, yeah, but yeah. What, where we feel we want to intervene in four pillars. One is the whole aspect of uh, domestic revenue mobilization, which IMF also has some aspects because, you know, as we all know, Ghana's revenue GDP ratio is quite low. Mm. And we're hoping to accompany IMF reforms, uh, government reforms to, to raise revenues. And there's a whole, whole aspect around, uh, uh, you know, fiscal management, uh, PFM, expenditure management. So we'll look at all these aspects. Pierre Lapoe in interaction with my colleague, George Yafit there. Let's stay a while longer on this. And thankfully, a senior finance lecturer at the University of Ghana Business School, Dr. Benjamin Amwa, joins us via Zoom with his perspective on a number of issues the World Bank director has touched on. Pleasure you could join us, um, sir. Good to see you once again. Now, Pierre Lapoe, in that exclusive interview with my colleague, George Yafit, touched on a number of issues. And first off, um, what do you make of the bank's plans to review future financial guarantee support for the country, uh, basically to check borrowing. This is absolutely necessary. And in a typical lender borrower relationship, you want to have your conditionalities or what is known as covenants in place because you want to make sure that the borrower, in this case Ghana, will have genuine purpose for the funds 
and the purpose for which the funds are being acquired will be used exactly as enshrined in the request for the facility. Mm -hmm. So it is not an attack on the sovereignty of Ghana as in the Britain Wood institution detecting to Ghana. Rather, it is part of managing the loan facility and to making, making sure that the loan will perform and use for the purpose for which the facility is coming in. So these conditionalities are much normal in a typical lender-borrower relationship. Mm. Let's narrow it down. And this time round, uh, the country director once again um, also hinted that its outfit may halt funding um, some of government's flagship programs, like the free SHS, um, if government does not listen to their proposals on the debt restructuring. Your take on that? Yeah, this is what we call a restrictive or negative covenant, where the lender want to prevent the possibility that the borrower will misuse the funds mm. or misappropriate the funds for which the lending has been sought. So for the World Bank to say that they will restrict funding, it is just an indirect way of forcing the government to make sure that the inefficiency that exists within the school feeding space is managed and to make sure that the overall purpose of funds that are earmarked for social intervention programs of this nature are adequately catered for and used for that particular purpose. So the restrictive covenant here is simply to make sure that our government will not misapply the funds. Mind you, you know, developing economies have this challenge where they go for funds for one particular purpose, and then from the moral hazard point of view, they use their money for something else, and it becomes difficult servicing these loan facilities. So clearly, let's restrict the borrower, and let's make sure the borrower will go by the details of what the funds have been set aside for. So that particular condition is in order. Mm. But Dr. Uh, Amoa, don't you think that they are bringing us back to increased debt levels with these pledges um, that we are hearing from the IMF, the World Bank, and of course, the African Development Bank? How do we manage the situation so that we don't rather end up incurring more debt? The, the loan facilities from IMF, ADB, and the World Bank are mostly concessionary, mm. which means very, very low rate. So if you look at the cost of these funds, vis-a-vis -vis the commercial ones that we go for, the euro bonds, etc., which are more expensive, is what sometimes creates problems for us. But if you look at the Britain Wood institutions and the purpose for which they were set up, they were basically set up to intervene in these areas. Their loans are in many instances almost zero rated by way of interest rate. We should also forget that having gone through the domestic debt exchange program, having had the waiver from some of the multilateral creditors. We have created enough physical space for us to get in more support, by way of creditor support, to turn around the economy. The strategy is, let us get these facilities so we can use it to turn around the economy. Once we are able to turn around the economy and we are able to improve on our revenue, we will surely be able to service these facilities that we are going in for. Mm. We are indeed grateful, Dr. Benjamin Moore, for your time here on Business Life. He's a senior finance lecturer at the University of Ghana Business School, sharing his perspective with us on the latest development there. A while longer on the economy, an associate professor of finance at the Andrews University in the USA, Williams Pipra, um, says Ghana's 36-month extended credit facility deal with the International Monetary Fund is inadequate to make anything significant um, in, economic impact, basically. He says the conditionality and policy demands from the IMF to mitigate Ghana's fiscal and debt vulnerabilities are drastic and demand a long-term approach. According to him, a five- to seven-year fiscal program is viable for an effective financial turnaround. Clinton Amwa has more. I'm Squeezy Pipra of the Andrews University School of Business Administration, USA, was speaking at a public lecture on the IMF bailout at the Christian Service University College in Kumasi. The public lecture was themed, Ghana, the fallen angel shall rise, lessons from the IMF bailout. The lecture was staged to educate the blame that academia is quiet and not contributing its quota to national discourse. 
Professor Williams Akwesi Pepra asserts the IMF deal would ensure stability and financial discipline of the government's financial behavior. I'm, I'm recommending that government, every government, should have some form of plug in to IMF in the form of IMF monitoring our operations. When IMF is around like a policeman, we tend to do the right thing, especially with our own document we have submitted to IMF. We are trying to be more disciplined. So in that case, it is prudent, and history has shown us that any time we have IMF in our governance system, our inflation rate, rate reduces, and that is what we are entreating. If inflation drops, your economy becomes stable, businesses will be able to go on well, employment will increase. The implementation program will have to to be in a long-term form. The three years is too short a time to see all the programs or all the things we want to implement. It's too short and it's too drastic. So if we have done the five to seven year program, then we have enough time to implement the programs gradually. From the document given by government, by the time the program ends in 2026, our debt to GDP ratio is expected to be around 76%. We will still not be financially sustained or we have to still go in for another program. The IMF extended credit facility of $3 billion was approved by the executive board on May 17th this year. The program will support Ghana in creating conditions for inclusive and sustainable growth. Sections of Ghanaians have raised concerns about harsh conditionalities for Ghana's deal with the IMF. Professor in Finance at the KNUC School of Business, Professor Joseph Magnus Frimpon, says Ghana's wasteful behavior is responsible for the seeming harsh conditions. He adds to the call for the government to review free SHS policy. If they are harsh, you would think they are harsh because uh, you are going for a loan at your personal level. If you think, if you know a friend of yours who is wasteful, okay, and he's coming to you for a loan, what will you do? You may not give it to him, but even if you give it to him, you make sure he doesn't use it to smoke. Wasteful, yeah, if you are not wasteful, we wouldn't be where we are. I don't see the solution coming easily because uh, it is because, uh, we have also been polarized by this NDC MPP. There is too much expenditure on this PHSS because we want equality. Equality is a myth. It doesn't exist. No matter what you do, when they, when they vacate, they go to different homes. So you cannot uh, enforce equality, but you can enforce equity, where everybody must be given a fair chance. Reporting for joining is Clinton. You're still watching Business Life with me, Pius Kojubaka. More after this break. Hello, welcome back. Let me take you to the northern belt of the country where the Upper West Regional Zonal Coordinator of the Ghana Productive Safety Net Project, Kwabna Bwating, has said that the focus of the second phase of the project will be to complete all irrigation dams under construction for use by farmers and also plant 1,900 hectares of cashew. Now, he says successes were attained during the first phase of the project, which ended in 2022 and needs to be replicated. Kwabna Bwating made the statement during handing over of 22 motorbikes to 11 municipalities and districts in the Upper West Region. The Ghana Productive Safety Net Project, GPSMP, is a social intervention initiative jointly implemented by the Ministry of Local Government, Decentralization and Rural Development and the Ministry of Gender, Children and Social Protection as part of the government efforts to improving the livelihoods of the people. Following the successful implementation of the first phase of the project, which started in 2019 and ended in 2022, the second phase quickly followed suit. The project is being funded by the World Bank at a cost of 100 million US dollars. Our Power Solution Zona coordinator of the GPSMP, Governor Boaton, spoke about the success struck in implementing the project and their target for the succeeding years. So for the very first phase, we've, um, the whole project has con uh, constructed a lot of dams, um, a lot of feeder roads, which is helping the, the farmers. And then um, for the irrigation purposes, it's been very great. That's why we are moving on to the, the second phase. And so what do you hope to achieve? Um, uh, before the end of December 2025, we want to make sure that 
um, all the dams are, are, are okay, they are in good shape for the farmers to irrigate their farms. We want to also make sure that um, about um, 60,000, uh, about 1,900 hectares of cashew uh, farms are also actually planted. One of the many challenges faced by officials of the GPSMP in its implementation of the project is their inability to have unfettered access to the communities and the project sites. The poor nature of roads in the communities and the project sites makes it difficult for officials to properly carry out their activities, especially monitoring of projects. In order to ease the challenge, our power Sudan minister, Dr. Hafiz Bin Sali, on behalf of the government and the implementing ministries, presented 22 motorbikes to all 11 municipal and district assemblies in the upper house region. The safety net program is implemented in 42 districts in the five regions of the north. Fortunately for us in the upper west region, all our districts are beneficiaries. And we know that to be able to carry out the activities embodied in the program, there is need for the field workers to be mobile so as to be able to carry out their monitoring and implementation activities. Dr. Binsali urged the beneficiary assemblies to use the motorbikes judiciously. It should be used for the purposes for which they are given. They should not be used for any other activity. As leaders of the assembly, please ensure that they are maintained. For us in the country, one of our minuses is our inability to maintain assets. So I will entreat you to ensure that once you take delivery of these valuable assets, you maintain them so as to prolong their lifespan. Reporting for Joy News, Rafik Salam. Wa. Away from the Upper West region, let me take you to the Ashanti region where tension has heightened at Ahujo in the uh, region as traders vow to prevent a private developer from um, allegedly taking over a market space. Now, the traders claim they have been served notice to evacuate the market for the private developer who lay claim to the space. After 40 years of occupying the space, the traders are unwilling to leave the area. Nana Yaojima has more in the following reports. The traders clad in red bands chanted war songs to communicate readiness to fight any individual who attempts to forcefully evict them. They claim to have been allocated the land in 1948 after petitioning the town and country planning department for a plot of land to trade. According to the traders, the city authorities reached an agreement with the then owner of the land to cede part to the community market. Former assembly member for the area, Abraham Bwedi, explained. They also recommended that they let Mr. Ohina Jukum two guys' list be redrawn. In pursuant to that above recommendation, a team comprising Candle, Opuni Mensa, the then KMA chief, Chief Executive, Mr. Daniel Ohina Jekum, the then Regional Minister, Aonjo Community Leaders, and the late Mr. Ohina Jekum, two guys, came to a gentleman agreement on the said land, Plot 37, Block I. It was divided into two. A and B, and the late Mr. Ohina Jekum took the bigger portion, leaving the other to Ahonjo community. Litigation over the ownership of the land has since continued. The new private developer laying claim to the property is preparing the grounds for construction, but the community is bent on halting the development. We wish to record here that even though the people of Aonju community are not violent, but we will not sit down, so we will not sit down for such things to happen to us. So we are, by this 
above emerge facts wish to appeal to Otun Force to to the second Asantehini to come to our assistance. At the time of Love News visit, some persons believed to be private security men had pitched camp on the land. Traditional leadership of the community has denied selling the land to the developer, though they say he had approached them to express interest. Kwejo Ananebuadu speaks for the family. Abushiano, you see a whole market, you pay market in Oho, any community center. The family says the place is a market and we want it to remain so. We want a community center built there as well. Even if the private developer is able to get the right authorities for the land to be released, we want him to build a market and a community center to compensate the community on part of the land. Now, Omo di assassino amani diha yeni ni ni hu mansun sembia ka ene se otina se ne mum ejana ye pene diye eni community center no onsi mai. Meanwhile, the private developer will not react to the agitation. For Joy News, Nana Ochima Kumasi. I am Pius Kujubaka. Grateful serving you. Do enjoy the rest of our programs. Bye bye.